Hey, Pastor Josh here. Thanks so much for watching our videos. If you'd like more information about Legacy City Church, you can go to LegacyCityChurch.com. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell below. God bless you. Hey, Legacy Pastor Josh here. So sorry I'm not there with you today. I am out with Katie on our anniversary, celebrating eight years of being married, and we're having a great time uh, relaxing and just enjoying time as a family. Last week, we celebrated five years as a church, and so many of you showed up, and it was an amazing celebration, a great time of fellowship. What a wonderful Sunday and way to look back and see what the Lord has done. We have left you in amazing hands, though, on this Sunday. I know he's going to minister to us as he is a great Bible teacher. Really love this guy and the way that he loves the Word of God and really loves our church. Uh, he is a very hard worker. Uh, you'll see him on the skyscrapers in downtown LA. And uh, he is also runs a very large family. And you know his wife very well, Sydney, who oversees our children's ministry. And so he is one of our faithful deacons. Let's give a warm legacy welcome to Mark Larson. You know, Josh asked me to, to do this. And he told me he was excited about me doing this. And I told him that I was excited too, but it was a nervous excitement. Um, this is not my comfort zone. I am, uh, I was so full of anxiety before this morning. I was uh, up till 12.30 last night preparing and then wide awake at four o'clock this morning. So, you know, and the, the irony, the irony of it is that I wanted to speak about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And here I was filled with anxiety. But that's okay, that's okay. That's how life is. I shared with the first service that it caused me to remember I struggled with depression for many years, for a long time, and I would seek God to relieve me, to heal me from depression. I also sought other methods. I, I tried medications. I, I added a exercise routine, changed my diet, and I remained in a state of depression. And I came to a place where I said, God, if this is how I am, and this is how I'm going to be, I'm going to worship you with what I have. And once I started living from that place, once I started making God the object of my affection, the source of my life. He began to heal my depression. And I found that I was doing the same thing with the anxiety of speaking this morning. I was full of anxiety and I was trying to have it alleviated. I was trying to polish a sermon. I wanted to put it together the way that Josh puts sermons together. I, I had a, a phone conversation with Josh and I told him essentially what I wanted to speak on. And he says, oh, that's great. So you, you, you state the, the problem, you state the solution. Here's your five points, you have your conclusion. And don't forget that you need a sentence to transition from one section to the other. I shared with the first service as well that my transition sentence is pretty much, um, so, you know, the, <clears throat> I'm not a public speaker, but I will share with you with what God's given me. And so I wanted to share with you this morning what God's been showing me I've been asking God this year to truly know him. 
not think I know him, not know about him, not even know what his word says, but to truly know him and walk with him. Then I came across a verse that says, you know, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And Jesus says, and love your neighbor as yourself, and this being the greatest commandment. So I started praying, God, I want to love you with all of my heart, with all of my mind, and with all of my strength. And I want to love my neighbor as myself whatever that really means. I mean, even the, the idea of that is greater than I'm able to comprehend. What does it mean to love God with all of your heart? You know, well, as I reflected upon and take, took note of my heart condition, I found that there were other things in my heart that took priority over God. Not all the time. But sometimes, I would obsess on things. I would focus on things other than God. God wasn't my priority. Well, as I sought God in this matter, he put me on a course um, that led to this passage that we're going to read this morning. So right now I'd like you guys to stand for the reading of God's word. We're going to be reading from the Gospel of John, John chapter 7, verse 37. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. You may be seated. So as we look at this text this morning, there's some obvious things that we can glean. Jesus was at a great feast. It was the Feast of Tabernacles. It was the greatest feast of, at the, in Jerusalem. It was a seven-day feast and this was the last day. And after the feast, after everybody who has had their fill has celebrated, Jesus stands up and he cries out. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water, and it speaks of the Spirit. So I ask you, who's thirsty? I think in, in my life, I tried to quench my thirst with lots of things, things of the world, whether it be good things or bad things. Um, if it was drugs and alcohol, or a career and family. I tried to fill a thirst that was unquenchable. But Jesus tells us that if we're thirsty, we can come to him. And not only will he quench our thirst, but from within, from within, will flow out rivers of living water. So not only is our thirst quenched, but others around us experience 
the fulfillment. And this he was speaking of, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwelling within us, dwelling within his church, from his innermost being, some, some translations say from his, from his heart will flow rivers of living water from the very center. Now, right now we're zoomed in on this passage. We're zoomed in on this moment, this moment of Jesus standing up at a feast and crying out. But now I want to back out. I want to zoom out. And I want to put this in the context of the larger picture. I want to zoom all the way out. And I want to look and go back to the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, man, Adam and Eve, had fellowship and communion with God. They met with God, they talked with God, there was no barrier between them, God had created them, and they were good in the sight of the Lord. And God delegated them authority to rule and to reign over creation. He told them they have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the creeping things on the ground, and they were to tend and keep the garden. He let Adam name the animals. He was co-ruling with them. But something happened. Fellowship was broken. God commanded Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Adam took it upon himself to choose his own will over God's will. And he took and he ate. It wasn't something God gave him. It wasn't a blessing that God, God told him he could eat of any tree of the garden except this one. But Adam took and he ate. He chose not to follow God's commandment. The relationship was broken. Eden was a place where heaven and earth met. God met man in Eden. God and man co-ruled over creation. Man and God had open communication. They fellowshiped together. Eden served as a temple of creation. When man destroyed the intimacy, he was no longer co-ruling with God. He got the boot. Out of the temple, no more fellowship, not the same fellowship. But the story wasn't over. God doesn't give up. This didn't catch God off guard. He had a plan. And God initiated a way for man to remain in fellowship with him. He established a way by choosing Abraham, who later, through Abraham's lineage, came Israel, the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel, God had Moses build a tabernacle. The tabernacle and the temple. The tabernacle and the temple are where God met with man. In the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the words of God were within the Ark of the Covenant, the, the glory of God filled the temple. And this is where... Moses met with God, the temple of meeting. No longer did man have free access to God. No longer did 
was the relationship one of intimacy, openness, and love. There was a barrier, and that barrier was our sin. But God worked through Moses, through sacrifice, through mediation, and man's relationship with God, though different, was still maintained in the temple. Heaven came down and met earth at the temple. Years went on, and the priests of the temple that tended and kept the temple, the temple grounds, the same way that Adam and Eve tended and kept the garden, the priests fell to the same fault that Adam and Eve did. They no longer wanted to co-rule with God. They became corrupt. They followed their own heart. And the temple, it says that the glory of the Lord had left the temple. They didn't want to co-rule with God anymore. So God initiated another way for man to fellowship with him. The perfect way. And that was through Jesus. Jesus came and he said that the temple that was existing in his day was corrupt. He called it a den of thieves. It become a marketplace, profit. It was no longer a house of prayer. Jesus says that his father's house is to be called a house of prayer. And that's what a temple should look like. A temple is a place where God rests and rules. Jesus, at his baptism, John the Baptist baptizes him, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, descends upon Jesus, and the Scriptures tell us that the Spirit remained upon Jesus. And then John the Baptist goes on to say that the one who sent him to baptize with water told him, that the one on whom he sees the Spirit descend and remain, it is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. He is the Son of God. So we see Jesus with God's presence dwelling within him. This is the picture of the temple. This is the true temple. In Jesus, we see heaven and earth meet. We see the rule and the reign of God meeting us here on earth in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus, God's own Son, God incarnate, the new temple. His body was a real place where heaven and earth unite. Jesus replaced the need for a temple In Jesus' case, the fullness of God dwelled in him and remained. Jesus, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, the true temple. In Jesus, God rests and rules. Through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we too, being baptized into Christ's body, become the temple of God. We hear that statement. 
Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? I guess that means that you cannot know. Don't you know, Paul says, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So he says, don't fornicate. Don't you know that God's presence dwells within you? When we're baptized into Jesus' body, we receive all that is Jesus's. We receive the ability to be temples where God's spirit rests and rules. What does that look like, though? Does it look like miraculous signs? Does it look like strange languages? It can. But Galatians tells us that where the Spirit is, there's fruit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is something we all say that we want in our lives. We all want love. Who, who, who doesn't want love? I want love. Yet we want love on our own terms. But where the Spirit is, there's love. There's joy. There's peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. All of these things, all of these characteristics that we all long for to have in our lives, or at least say that we do. But these things are only true where the Spirit of God is, where He rests and rules. The Bible tells us that we can resist the Spirit. The Bible tells us that we can quench the Spirit. But like the song that we sang today, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Freedom from these other things that plague us. Freedom from our old self. Freedom from the things we obsess on, the other things that we put in our temple. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. And the only way to do that truly is by having the Spirit in us because the Word tells us that the Spirit of God takes away our stony heart and gives us a tender heart of flesh. He allows us to feel. He allows us to be real. He allows us to love. The ultimate fruit of the Spirit, where God is, is love. But the Bible tells us to be led by the Spirit, which means that we can choose not to. The Word of God tells us to die to ourselves, stop exerting our own will, and pray, Thy will be done. Father God, here on earth, here on earth as it is in heaven. Right now, heaven has come to earth. God's rule and God's reign has been initiated. Jesus Christ came and announced, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He was announcing his own kingship, king of creation, Jesus, the rightful king. The kingdom of God is at hand, but it didn't work out how everybody thought it would. He was crucified for us. He died in our place. And through that sacrifice, we receive from Him His Spirit. He redeemed us. 
his rule and reign becomes true in our hearts because we are, again, baptized into the body of Christ. And he gives us his spirit to rule and to reign. God's kingdom come in our hearts. Peter tells us that we are all being built together as living stones, as a dwelling place for God, for God to dwell. Is God at home in your heart? Does God's spirit rest and rule in your heart? This is a question that we need to ask. The word also tells us that if we have not the spirit of Christ, we are not his. It's not being religious that saves us. It's not even doing the right things that save us. It's putting our faith and hope in Jesus Christ, asking him for a drink. Come to Jesus, all you who thirst. And out of our innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The early church at the day of Pentecost, Jesus had told his disciples to go and wait and they would receive the spirit, power from on high. Earlier, Jesus had said that he was going away and his disciples were sad and downcast, but he said that it was better, better that he go away because if he went away, he would send God's presence, the Holy Spirit. And he now in Jesus, while, while, he was with, while they were with Jesus, the Holy Spirit was with them. But Jesus promises that now the Holy Spirit will be in them. You know, so this changed my, the way that I pray. You know, I had it in my mind how Maybe God hears me, and I, I just sort of pictured it as, you know, I'm throwing my prayers out to heaven. God is closer. He's not way out there. The relationship that we have with God is close and intimate, woven together in the temple of our hearts. Jesus prayed that his disciples would be one. He in them, them in God, in the same way that Jesus was in God and God in him. And all, you know, that's a passage that was confusing to me. But I begin to see that now, that we have within us the very presence of the creator of all things, creator of the universe, maker of heaven and earth, king of kings, lord of lords, the alpha and the omega dwells within our hearts, has a relationship with us, and ultimately, It talks about the Holy Spirit being a down payment. Just, it's a down payment. It's just the beginning of God's rule and reign here on earth. Ultimately, all of creation becomes God's temple. It tells us in Revelation chapter 21, when the new city Jerusalem comes out of heaven and is on earth, that there is no more temple because the Father and the Lamb become the temple and dwell with man. 
you know, for a long time, I thought, when you die, you go to heaven or you go to hell. And you spend your life preparing to go to heaven, hoping that you go there. But the reality is that heaven comes to earth. God has redeemed man and God has redeemed creation. And God will dwell with man here on earth. And those that die in the Lord will be resurrected and be here with us. We were created by God to have dominion over this earth, to be caretakers of it. And that plan's still in action. We will be with God and we will be here. But things will be right. He tells us that he will wipe away every tear. There'll be no more pain, no more crying. All things will be good because where God is, there is love, there is joy, there is peace. All of those things where God rules and rests, things are right. So this morning I ask, does the spirit of Christ dwell within you? That's good, Serge. So we got one. <laughs> Paul tells us, those that follow Christ, don't you know that the spirit of God dwells within you and your body is a temple. You know, it's sort of like, sort of like science, you know, you, you see something, whether it be an animal or a planet or, and, or the moon, you see it, but you don't understand it, you just know it's there. But then later you find out the specifics about it, how it works, what's inside. You know, and, and I sort of feel like that's how it is with God, is I know, I know that I know him, I know that he called me, but then do I know that the Spirit of God dwells within me? Yeah, I do, because I see the fruit. I see the love, I see the peace. When I choose to serve God and follow him, the fruit is there. So I'd ask each one of us this morning just to take a look inside. Are you experiencing God's presence? Because if you're not, Jesus tells us clearly, just come to him. Come to him. He's done the work. It's a free gift. And out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. No longer will you thirst but you will be a source of life for others. If anyone believes, this is what Jesus refers to as drinking. If anyone believes in me, meaning putting your faith your trust, your hope, making Christ the Lord of your temple. Let him rule, let him reign through his spirit. Confessing your sins, trusting in him, trusting in the finished work on the cross, 
receiving the Holy Spirit, experiencing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. It's awesome. And then being with God for all eternity, knowing him and being known by him. If you feel today that maybe you don't know, maybe you don't have, maybe you're not sure, and I would invite you to pray with me this morning and ask Jesus for the living water, putting your faith and trust and hope in him and receiving everything good in exchange for our own brokenness. It's a great deal. So if you would bow with me right now, I'd like to end this service with a prayer. And if you'd like to pray along with me, please do. Holy Jesus, Holy Father, we come before you this morning, some of us thirsty, Lord, longing for fulfillment, tired of living in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Lord, we know that you are the source of life, that in your presence is fullness of joy. And you tell us that by coming to you and simply asking, we can receive. So this morning, Lord, we ask to receive from you all that you have for us. We confess our sins before you. We lay down our idols, those things within our hearts, Father God, that we've placed above you that we've prioritized over you. We choose to lay those things down and ask that you would enter into the innermost depth of our hearts, that you would find your home and that your spirit would live and dwell, rest and rule, within our hearts, and that we would know you. We ask that you would lead us, that you would guide us, that we would hear your voice, that you would gift us, that we would encourage others, Lord, that we would love you with all of our hearts, with all of our mind, with all of our strength and that we would love others. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for purchasing us. We thank you for redeeming us. We thank you for opening our hearts, for opening our eyes. And we ask, that you would help us, just help us. Help us to maintain that fellowship. Help us to not make the same mistake, to turn away from you, to rule and reign on our own. We ask to co-rule with you, to follow your lead, be led by you. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mark.